All right. A uh, quick reminder for you guys. So we do have a review session held by myself on Friday for your midterm. It's going to be this Friday, 3 p.m., Lasan Building B. Okay, so just be there. Uh, I think we can stay there up to two hours for as many questions as you like. It's going to be the agenda will be set just by you. Bring, just bring your question. If you want, to, want me to uh, repeat certain part of the lecture, feel free just to go there and make a re request. Okay. Uh, quite a bit to cover today, but whatever that will be covered today, uh, it will be on the midterm. Okay, so let's uh, uh, just go over them. First material. So far we talk about inheritance, polymorphism, dynamic binding. And this is the last slide for the inheritance lecture. And I would like to review very quickly, hopefully not too long. Basically, don't be t too terrified by the table over here. We just try to make things general and very complete and formal. What I will do is, I'll basically go over all the type checking rules with you together and then give you an example so you can really fully appreciate uh, what we have been learning. So you want to really get a complete picture of polymorphism dynamic binding, especially polymorphism. Okay, let's do it. Okay, one by one. Number one, it's very easy. Okay. In general, if you see any assignments like this, you say something, some variable is assigned to another variable y. So what's the really the type checking rule over here? Since we talk about compilation, so only the static types matters. Okay, so what you gotta do is you gotta figure out, first of all, what's the static type for y and what's the static type for x. And then you want to check to see if this is a descendant class of this as easy as that. Okay, just see example very quickly as a warm up. Let's say we got S1, S2, S3. You can see over here, I don't have, have any create statements, which means the dynamic type is not relevant at this point to uh, judge for compilation. So now, out of these, can you just tell me which ones will compile? Okay, let me just number them, I forgot. Let's say number one, two, three, four, five, and six. Tell me the ones that will compile, positive. One and two, one I agree. Two, would it compile? Okay, very good. And this one, no, right? Because this, the static type is students, which is not a descending class of the static type for S2, which is resident students, right? I am assuming that you know the hierarchy for the three classes very well. That's why I didn't include it. And this one doesn't compile for the re same reason. What about this one here, number five? Would it compile? Well, somehow they are not really descendant of parents, right? They are more like a sibling, yeah. right? Since they are not descendant class uh, of the other, so it wouldn't compile. Okay, so that's a little bit a uh, tricky case. What about number six? Oh, yeah, I meant to, oh, of course that wouldn't compile because S doesn't exist for different reasons. I meant to say S1, okay? So it wouldn't compile, okay? It's not a descendant class, right? S1 is students. Okay, that one's very easy. Let's get to something a little bit trickier. We've we got six different rules to go over. Number two, let's say over here you have, you try to make a method or feature call. X is an object and then dot some feature F and then you try to pass an argument Y. Okay, we have actually learned that already, but let's see example. Actually, before I do that, let me mention what the type, type checking rules are. Okay, number one, you want to make sure F exists in the static type of X. Okay, what I, what I meant is over here, you can see that since we only talk about compilation, so you want, first of all, you want to look up what X de uh, is declared to be. So what's the static type of X? You want to make sure F is declared inside this particular class, right? Make sure it's available. It's part of the expectation. And also you want to make sure Y the static type for y, the static type for y should be a descendant class of the formal type for the very first parameter for this particular feature, right? That's what we learned. Let's see example. Okay, again, we got SMS, student management system, well, S1, S2, S3, okay? Again, let me number them, one, two, three, four. What about number one, would it compile? Be careful. There's no typo here. Does it, does it compile? Yes? No? Yes? 
Aha, uh -huh, what about S1? Can I say S1 dot add RS? Yeah, exactly. Remember, it's part of the type checking rule. Be careful. We, don't, we, don't, we didn't even get to the polymorphism part. You can see over here, we want to make sure the add RS is defined in the static type for S1, which is students. Is add RS a feature of students? No, it's a feature of SMS. So this does not compile. OK, be careful. All right. OK, number two. There's a compile over here. And you can also see the dec uh, declaration for at RS at the top. Okay? There's number two compile. OK, let's figure out. OK, first of all, at RS is a feature of the static type for SMS. That's what, that part is OK. S1, the static type is students. I'll put S over here. And what about the formal argument type for at RS? It's RS. Is S a descendant class of RS? No. So, does not compile. Okay? Hopefully getting smoother, right? Okay? Number three, does it compile? Number two, yes. Uh, number three, yes, of course, because S2, the static type is RS, which is a descendant class of the formal argument type. What about number four? Nope, right? Because static type over here is NRS, as we declare over here. NRS is definitely not a descending class of RS. So this one also no. OK, are we good so far? OK, as you can see, it's not that difficult. You just have to know the principle. OK? Any question until now? Are we OK? OK, let's see rule number three. Rule number three, we just add one more complication over here. You can see we still have a feature call, but we also bring in assignments over here. Okay, let's see this. What would be the type checking rule, first of all? Whatever that used to apply to this particular feature call should also apply, which means uh, F must exist in the static type for X, and also the static type for Y must be a descendant class of the formal arguments of feature F. More than that, how do we make this assignment compile, though? We know the left-hand side, we can simply look up the static type of Z. That's not a problem. But how do we know the right-hand side static type? What should we look up? The return type, exactly. Good? OK. So now let me be careful here. So now you basically look at that. What's the uh, static type of return value of f? And then you can look at the static type for z and see if this is a descending class of that. OK, the similar pattern. OK, let's do exercise together. OK, again, we got SMS, S1, S2, S3, as before. Uh, one, two, three, four. Number one. Okay, good. You can see the trick, right? Okay, the problem is S2 over here, the static type uh, is students, which does not have this feature defined, right? Similar. By the way, don't be too surprised. That's exactly how the type checking rules are implemented in Eclipse and Eiffel Studio. Okay? You can just do the same. Number two. Would it compile? OK. Now you can see that over here, 1 matches integer, so that's no problem. And then sms.getS, the static return type will be students. It, uh, the static type for S1 will be also students. Is students a descendant class of itself? Yes. Good. Very good. What about number 3? Hopefully you see that, right? Good. Again, the right-hand side, static type for the return type is students. And then the static type for S2 is RS. Is students a descending class of RS? No. Very good. Finally, number four. Also no, right? Similar reason. Okay, let me just repeat again for completeness. Again, you look at the static type for the return value for this particular feature, which is students. Okay, students over here. Uh, students at the right hand side. The static type for the left hand side is NRS. Now, is students a descending class of NRS? No. 
Okay, so far we have gone through three. Not too bad. So now we may want to bring cast into the context. Okay? Not too bad. All right, let's see the easiest case. Let's say we do some cast over here. We want to cast some variable y. In general, y can be any expression. Let's just focus a little bit simpler case. Okay, we'll see some more complicated case a little later. So now, let's see that. We know that in order to do a cast, that means we want to change the expectation for the variable, right? So to change the expectation, we can even either make it more or less. To make it more, we downcast to the descending classes. To make it less, we upcast to the uh, ancestor classes, right? So now basically, look at the static type for this expression over here. What's the static type for y? And also, what's this class over here? And then try to see if c is, there are two cases, either the ancestor of the static type of y, that would be okay. So that's more like uh, upward casting. Or it can be descendants of the static type of y. So that's downward casting. Okay? Good. That's the principle. Okay, now let's see again SMS, S1, S2, S3. Okay? And then we have different 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay? Now, number 1 is. Yeah. Okay, th thinking this way. The question was, are we, you're talking about general form, very good, very good. Uh, you're asking whether we are casting y to c or casting c to y. What is y over here? It's more like an expression or variable, right? And c is not a variable, it's a class name. Can you cast a class name to a variable? No, so that direction doesn't make sense, right? That, that can be the tricky part about general form because you don't see any concrete example, right? But when you see the concrete example, for example, can you cast resident students class into S1? You cannot, right? It doesn't make sense. It should really, should really be the other way around. Okay, now, number one, should it compile? If you think that compiles upward or downwards, or neither? It seems, seems to be uh, downwards, right? Let's see exactly why it's downwards, okay? It's really important for you to see. So now, uh, S1, the static type is students. And now, students is actually a descending class of RS. So the cast is okay, but we're doing downward casting. R, yeah, RS over here. Remember S under which we got RS and NRS, right? So S1 is of static type S. And we are trying to cast into RS. So it's downward casting. Okay? Good, so that will compile. Questions? Yeah, so downward casting can be dangerous, you're right. But downward casting is actually allowed because it depends on the programmer's awareness. So for you as a programmer, you must know very well at this point what the dynamic type is for your objects. So you must make sure you cast to the okay descendants, but the compiler doesn't care. Again, it's an undecidable problem for the compiler to judge. It's a good question. Yeah. You can also do a check. Remember, attached syntax is just like an instance of. Mm -hmm. I didn't really mention exactly how you do it. You can just say if attached a particular class right. and then whatever expression it. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, number one is okay. What about number two? This seems to be upward, right? Because S2 is of type uh, RS. And then you're going from RS into S, so it's upwards. It's like upwards casting. So upwards means you're reducing the expectation. You're reducing. You might be wondering why you want to reduce the expectation. Sometimes it could be for access control. Maybe you want to pass some object reference to some other clients, but you do not want them to actually get access to some particular features of the original objects. So you can give them another reference, which is alias to the original objects, but has a more restrictive static type. Okay, that's kind of the idea. But anyway, that's a little bit aside. Okay, the first one, by the way, is downward casting. Okay, what about number three? It's, it's neither downward nor upwards. Okay?
because you can see that what well, that means it was compilation error. No, because S1 is students and student well SMS simply doesn't belong to this hierarchy here. Okay, so it does not compile very good. What about number four? Yeah, yeah, simply, yeah, yeah. I just yeah before you. Uh, so this one is actually NRS and NRS and RS nothing to do with each other. So it just wouldn't come out. Yes. Oh, you know what? You talk about upward cast and downward cast. I will have one example to show you. Just bear with me. Yeah, I do have one. I think uh, the, you asked that question last time, so I created some new slides. Yes. Correct. I would say, it's e yeah, you're right. Either you can say it's not in the hierarchy, that's one issue, or they're simply uh, a sibling. I would say sibling is not that, si it's not a complete list. It could be uh, it's uncle, or it could be it's uh, aunt, right? I mean, just different parts of the hierarchy. So I would say if it's neither ancestor nor ancest uh, or descendants, then it wouldn't compile. Say it again, I don't quite get, catch your question. Yeah. Can you do. What if I, I cast the that you You're talking about doing some upward casting and then downward casting, right? You're talking about some sequence. Yes, we'll see what an example. Yes, in some way, the compiler is very simple minded. Compiler only knows about if you want to do at this point, you try to do some upward casting or downward casting, then I will just allow it. I don't care whether you're going to have some runtime issues or not. That's just not valid syntax uh, when you do cast. Uh, I think that's a bit off track. I would say uh, maybe top offline. Okay, that'll be better. Okay. Okay, now finally, what about number five? You can see for number five here, I'm trying to show you one example. You don't necessarily always have to cast a variable into some static type. You can cast any expression as long as they have a type. Okay. Okay. So I heard that downward casting very good, but let's be a little bit uh, more complete over here. If you want to judge to see if this expression over here, the whole thing compiles or not, there are several bits you have to check before you talk about cast. First of all, SMS has to be declared. Yes, it is. And get, oh, you know what? It should be get s. Otherwise, you wouldn't compile, right? Sorry about that. Yeah, you want to make sure this get s feature is defined in the static type for SMS, which is right. And then you want to make sure one matches the type for integer over here. Indeed, it is uh, one, yes. And then, now we are OK. Now, overall, what's the static type for this particular expression here? Should be, what's the static type for this whole expression over here? That should be the return type, right? Okay, since we are making a feature call over here. So that should be students over here. Okay, students. And finally, can we cast some objects of static type into RS? Yes, yes we can. It's downward casting. Whether that's safe or not at the runtime is another story. Okay, downward casting. Okay, guys, any question about here? Okay, yes. You mean the last example? Yes, exactly. That's the point. So we look at what's beside the cast type over here. You can see this expression here. The reason that we look at the return type is because this expression here is simply a feature call. So we just go to the return type for that particular feature. That's what the compiler can do the best. Look at the decoration. Alrighty, number five. Just one slight, uh, one slight complication added. So now, not only that we want to do the cast. If the cast succeeded, let's use the uh, cast variable to see how we can use it. Okay. Basically, again, in order for this cast, in order for this cast to really succeed, what's the static type for y? And make sure it's either upward casting or downward casting into C. Right. That's what we said in the previous notes. And then, if the uh, cast actually succeeded, then this temp will be assigned the new uh, static type. Okay, so now if I want to do this expression over here, like an assignments, it won't be the type checking rule over here. Well, 
as we said in the very first temperature checking row, if you only look at the assignment alone, the static type for temp must be a descending class of the static type for x, right? But what's the static type for temp? C, right? Okay, that's the only trick you have to know. Because over here, you can see that this is where we introduce the temp over here. And the temp is simply the result of casting y into static type C. That's why the static type uh, of temp is C. Okay, so now over here, for the temp, the static type is simply just C. So now, how do we know if this assignment over here will be compilable? We want to check to see if C is a descendant class of the static type of X, right? Hopefully everything makes sense. Want to see if C is a descendant class of the static type of X. Okay, let's do example, only two. So now again, SMS, S1, S2, S3. Now we have this uh, cast over here. So I can tell you the cast itself compiles. Again, we know that the static type for here is students. A student is a descending class of RS, so we are doing downward casting, all right? And then the temp right now after the cast is going to have the static type exactly this one here, okay? Just RS, okay? Given this information, we are ready to answer the following, okay? Let's say number one and number two. What about number one? Yes, right, because we are basically, uh, RS is a descending class of the static type of S1, which is students. Okay, we know that this static type is RS. For here, static type is students, and this is a descending class of that. What about number two? No, right? Okay, I would say as long as you figure out the static type of temp is actually uh, RS, everything else will be easy. Okay, so temp over here is RS, S3 over here is NRS, neither, it's not a des uh, descendants, right? It's not a descendants, okay? So this one, no, this one, yes. Yes. Oh, I'm just trying to show you individually, I'm just being lazy over here. So basically the line number one over there will compile, but line number two, you will get compilation error. Yep, so basically over here, the cast itself will succeed. Basically attached, RS, this expression over here as temp, this expression here will simply compile. You'll just compile and then go ahead and go into the... Uh, the, so that will be the only the temp will be cast as RS. Yeah, basically what you're doing is you're trying to... Yeah, let me just mention since you talk about it. Whatever objects this expression is referring to, we're creating an alias of that, which is temp. And the temp has the static type RS. Okay. Okay. Final one. Okay. Pretty much the same, but now rather than having an assignment over here, we have a feature call. Okay. Again, we know how to type check feature call. Very easy. First of all, judge to see if this uh, this cast will compile or not, and then if the uh, we want to see what's the static type for Y, and then to see if this is either an uh, ancestor for out outward casting. Oh, sorry, let me say it again. What we want to do is check to see what's the static type of Y. If C is an ancestor for static type of Y, it's upward casting. If C is a descendant class of this static type of Y, it's going to be a downward casting either way. Okay? If the cast is okay, we're going to assign temp to be of static type C. Okay? And then given that information, we know how to type check this. We did it already. Let's try. Okay, SMS, S1, S2, S3. Okay, this is number one, this is number two. Okay, what about number one? Do you think that will compile? First of all, would the, would the cast be okay? Yes, right? Is it upward casting or downward casting? Downward casting, right? We know that this part here is students over here, students over here, and then it's downward casting to RS, so now the static type is RS. And now, temp over here, static type is RS. Is RS a descendant class of the formal type over here? Yes, good, passed, okay? And let's do number two. Was number two okay? 
Seems to be no, right? Oh, uh, really? Uh, is the cast okay? The cast is okay, right? The cast, uh, in, in this case, is downward casting or upward casting? Downward, just to another uh, uh, descendant, okay? Downward casting over here. That means the static type for that would be just RS. Now, static, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, write it properly. NRS. So this would be NRS, the static type. Is NRS a descendant of the formal argument type here, which is RS? No. Neither is uh, actually not a descendant of that. So it doesn't compile. Okay, it's not too bad, right? Yes. Yeah, basically, whatever I put cross mark uh, in all the six rows, they're just type checking rules at the compile time. Of course, uh, we also got another part of the story. If things compile, you might still run into assertion error at the runtime, which you have to consider the uh, dynamic type. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's error You mean, okay, you're saying in IFO, if things compile, can you still run into runtime violation? Is that what you're asking? It's runtime. It's runtime. Yeah, so basically, uh, you can review the uh, part of what's, uh, what we said about last time. If, for example, this part over here compiles, okay, it doesn't really guarantee that it will actually be runtime assertion free because you still have to uh, uh, consider what's the uh, dynamic type for this one here. I'll give you one example, okay? I'll give you one example. So this one here compiles, no problems. This one compiles. Now, let me ask you one thing. Let's say sms.get s and then one is going to return static type students, right? But what can be the dynamic type? We said there can be three possible dynamic types. can be students, resident students, and non-resident students, right? Let's say if the dynamic type, now we talk about runtime behavior. If the dynamic type is actually nrs, that means when you are expecting to make use of temp as a resident student, you might want to say something like temp dot, let's say set premium rates, right? But now, NRS objects dynamically just don't have that feature. It doesn't. So that's why this will run into runtime assertion error, runtime. Okay, this is actually not part of the type checking rule. I'm just saying the runtime behavior, which we did talk about last time. Yes. The form one. Which one? Uh, the type checking rule. Five or. That's okay. You mean number three or number four? Three. Three is actually not okay because you can see S1, the aesthetic type is actually students. For this one over here, you know what? For this one, let me check. Let me check. Yeah, let me check and maybe clarify next time. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, I will just, for that one, I will uh, talk a bit specifically, maybe uh, uh, by checking uh, Apple Studio, but for others, it's the same. You basically, again, check ancestor or descendants. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, actually, no, in Java, I know, the Java syntax is actually easier. I would say the syntax is easier, okay? Uh, over here, I'll just give you one example. For this one over here, let's say number four. Okay, you know what? Let me just say this. Let me say for this one over here, for number one, what would be the corresponding syntax in Java? Let's think about it, okay? Basically, what I would do is, I would say temp, which is of uh, static type RS, temp is assigned to, and then I'm doing a cast to RS, and then I will say SMS dot get students at position one, and then I can say sms dot add rs and then temp. 
Okay, these two lines correspond to exactly this. So the ideas are really the same. It's just the way you wrap around the syntax is different. The idea is really there. Just the same. So whatever polymorphism and dynamic binding or inheritance idea we talk about in iPhone, they are simply general for any OOP. So you can apply the same idea to C sharp or to Java. Yeah. yeah. You just have to know the corresponding syntax. Yeah. Okay. Okay, if you have no question, given that we know about the type checking rules, uh, so hopefully now this slide wouldn't be too challenging for you, but I can review what we said. What I, what I would like to do now is to give you one more example, and we'll do it as an exercise together. Yeah? Can we do an example on the dynamic type check? Dynamic type check? Yeah. You mean like how you... Like the runtime check. Runtime check, yes. Uh, it might be tested on. Okay, if you want to do it, yeah, why not? Uh, yes, correct. Let me just give you one example. How about this? Yes. Thank you. Let's do the following. If I say S of type students, and then I say, I know that this is static type. And then what I would do is, I'll do it in the next line. I would say create, uh, and then dynamic type, let's say RS. S dot make. So that means the dynamic type is RS, right? Okay, let's now do some test. I can say check attached, and then I'll cast that into NRS, okay? And then I would say S, S, maybe I would say temp. And over here, okay, and then after that, I will actually want to do s dot, oh sorry, not s dot, temp dot, so temp would be, let's say, set discount rate, maybe 1.5, uh, no, 0 0.75, like that. Okay, that's a fragment, I'll let it show. Now. Does this fragment compile or not? Let's decide together, okay? By following the rules. As far as compilation is concerned, let's look at the following. First of all, we know that S, the static type is simply students. And are we doing downward casting or upward casting? Downward, downward very good, downward casting. So this cast will be okay. So that means after the cast, temp is going to be of static type NRS. Knowing that temp is going to be of static type NRS is set discount rate defined for the non-resident students. Yes, right? Non-resident student got a discount rate. And 0 0.75 is also uh, whatever the value type is, right? So this one's fine. Compilation concern. Com as far as the compilation is concerned, this compiles. However, the problem is as follows. If you look at it, uh, if you look at the following. If you have, uh, this is the rationale why it would, there will be a runtime assertion error, okay? This is why. You can see, uh, let me draw that to you. S is basically pointing to, so S is over here. It's pointing to a resident student's objects, which has premium rates only, not discount rate. And S is of static type students, okay? That's how we started with, right, up to here. And now, after, at this point over here, okay, if we can reach that point, what does that mean? That means we have another uh, NRS is a static type, and over here we got temp. It's basically pointing to the same object, it's just that their static type is different, right? Now, if we actually allowed, so it's more, more like proof by contradiction, if we allowed the cast to succeed. What's the consequence? The consequence is this a line like this is going to make use of temp as if it was 
a non-resident student's object by calling the set discount rate. However, dynamically speaking, it's actually pointing to a resident student. So we know that such situation like this can crash your system. So that means that you wouldn't be even allowed in the first place at the runtime. Okay? So that means that means uh, crash when calling uh, temp dot set discount rate and then 0 0.75. So that means not allowed at the cast. Okay, which is over here. So that means this part simply just going to fail first, even before you reach this line at the runtime. It should be an ancestor of its dynamic type, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I said also in the PDF notes. Okay, yeah. So guys, make sure you check uh, you know, the lectures page. There's uh, short notes, brief notes about how you can do cast. So what Raymond says is exactly correct. Let me summarize. If you want to do a cast, for the cast to compile, you must make sure the type is either upward casting or downward casting. However, to make sure any compilable cast has no runtime assertion failure, you have to bring dynamic type into place. That means the dynamic type must be a descending class of the type you're trying to cast into. Okay. Anyway, check the notes. All right, any more questions before I move on to exercise? Say it again, what do you mean? Which means just cast to itself. No, no, it's not, it's not good. Yeah. Well, if it has the same feature, that means you're overriding it, right? Yes. Uh, okay, sure. Basically, the question was, you're t basically asking about this arrow over here, right? Yeah, okay. The reason that we got this arrow over here was because when we were trying to do this cast, the intention is we know that S is currently pointing to this particular objects. We're going to create an alias, like another reference, pointing to the same objects. But that object static type is going to be whatever we are cast casting into. So that's the meaning for doing a cast. Okay? Yeah. Yes. You mean use uh, you mean NRS over here? Yeah, so you all, of course you, you try to do the cast when you are very sure at this point S is really pointing to a non-resident student's objects. You might be wrong, of course. Yeah, so that, that's why you gotta be careful. Again, remember what we also said last time in the end. If you find that you have to do casting so often, that means when you first declare the type for the variable might be a wrong design decision. We'll see that actually when we talk about generics. Yeah, at the runtime, okay, let me just summarize. Good question. So at the runtime, compile time, okay, it will just compile. At the runtime, what's going to happen is there will be a runtime assertion error right here. At runtime, assertion failure here. At runtime, you don't even reach this line. Because this already fell, so you wouldn't even reach there. Yeah, simply because the direction now is the compiler thinks in this way. If they actually allow this to actually happen, then that means any future line that will actually try to call any non-resident student specific feature is going to crash anyway. So we're going to prevent right in the beginning. Right? It's more like a precautionary action the, comp uh, the runtime is doing. OK. Uh, yes. Yes, you can. Uh, I didn't really mention explicitly this uh, in the slides, but that's more more or less what you did in Java. You can definitely do something like this. You may do if 
like uh, if I want to check to see if that's really an instance of, you can say attached. And RS, basically the same part for that part here. S, S, actually. Then, and there you can do something over here and then end. So this part over here is really doing a, like a whatever you did before for instance of. Okay? It's possible. Yeah. You can feel free to apply that to your lab or projects if necessary. But I would say the reason I'm using the check is I want to express that maybe I'm really sure, so I don't need to do it if check. Just say check. You mean I talk about the CAS itself? Yeah, the reason that the CAS is OK, compilation is, uh, as far as compilation is concerned, the static type for S is students. And NRS is actually a descendant class. That means we're doing downward casting. So that's OK. Yeah. Yeah, the net dynamic type is about runtime behavior. So there are two issues here. For the compile compilation type, is OK. The compiler wouldn't say anything. At the runtime, since your dynamic type is not going to meet the expectation of the CAS type, it's going to give you some runtime error. That means the, uh, at the runtime, yeah, it's, uh, exactly what I trying to explain over here, right? Because the actual dynamic type is actually RS. RS is not going to meet the expectation for NRS. So that means at the runtime, it's not going to work. Right? Yeah. OK, guys, any more questions before I move on, before we do some exercise together? Yeah? Well. Well, this problem here, basically the principle is, whenever you try to do cast as a programmer, there are two things you want to think about. Are you really sure the type you're trying to cast into is really that dynamic type that's going to match? If you're not so sure, you better not do it. Okay, yeah. And also, as we'll actually say for the generics uh, lecture, so when you find that you have to write such check, uh, like a cast too often, that means there's something wrong with your design. Uh, it's kind of polluted. It's kind of uh, very uh, inconvenient. Also, it's not very, yeah, as we'll see, yeah, we'll see something like that. Yeah. Okay, exercise together? All right. But as far as the midterm is concerned, as long as you understand what I said in the class, it should be safe. Okay. Okay, let's have one, have a look at one exercise together. You will get a chance to uh, also do something as well. Okay, there's a new slide I made. I would like you to grab a piece of paper, okay? Given A, B, C, D over here, can you simply just draw the inheritance relationship between A, B, C, and D? Okay, let's do it together. <laughs> okay, you do that first, I'll do it on the iPad and then we'll, we'll check the answer together. We got four classes, right? Okay. Okay, just take uh, another 20 seconds. Hopefully it's not too hard to draw. Make sure the arrow direction is correct. All right. Okay, another 10 seconds, and then we'll compare the answer. <laughs> Example midterm solution, maybe a little bit later tomorrow. Okay, ready? Let's see. Right? Well, anybody drew wrong? Any, anybody disagree? 
Okay, we're okay, right? Let's. All right, guys. If we, uh, wow, maybe you make sure you draw a little bit faster than this, right? Yeah. Well, in the meeting, you might be given twenty classes, right? Maybe I don't know. All right, let's see. Okay, let's look at this fragment of code here. It's completely symbolic. What does that mean? That means you cannot gain any intuition from the class name. That's intentional, right? Well, actually, if, if I really want to confuse you, I can make students a descendant class of resident students, right? So please, let's be uh, very uh, careful here, okay? So now, is line number three, uh, you know what, let's, uh, let's do, have a look at that and think about your answer. I'm gonna copy the line over to the iPad and we'll do it together. Compile, compilation. Okay, give you another 20 seconds. I'm just copying the line. Okay, just the same. Just bear with my writing. Okay, now we got, uh, let's say, two portions over here. Uh, let's say one, two, and three. Let's look at line by line. Is line number one okay? Good. Okay, let's not bother explaining, okay? It's okay, okay? What about line number two? No, not at all. Why? Let's see. Again. B static type is B. Is B a descendant class or ancestor of D? No. Okay, good. Not yet. That's not just about exercise. Exercise goes even more interesting. Okay, have your diagram ready. I want you to, let's say I, re oh, let's say I really want to do this. Is it possible? I really want to cast B into D. I really want to do it. Let's say I really, really want to do it. Aha, uh -huh, exactly, you can see from the tree, right? So now I cannot go directly to here, the path doesn't work. Why don't I go to A and then downward casting? You see what I mean? But, well, let's see, what well, we're only talking about if that can compile or not. Whether that's safe or not, we'll talk about it. Okay, that's the idea. So what does that mean? That means, let's say you're programming iPhone or Java, you can always upward casting to either object class or any class, and then you can downward cast into any class you like. That's basically what we're learning here. Because remember, in the case of iPhone, any is the root of the hierarchy. In the case of Java, object is the root of the hierarchy. You can always upward casting to the, the root. That's fine and do the downward casting to any of the descending classes that you like, because any class is a descending class of objects or any, right? That's kind of the idea. But are, we re are you really doing yourself a favor? Not necessarily, right? Okay, but before I say that, let's have a look. So basically the idea is, uh, okay, you guys know that pretty well. If you look at this line here, that's exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to do two cast, okay? The two cast is basically, uh, let's review the diagram very quickly. We want to first cast from B into A, which is upward casting, and then from A into D, which is downward casting. That's exactly what we're doing here. You can see upward casting from B into uh, type A. And then whatever temp one we get is now have, has static type A. And then we want, to we want to cast from temp one, which is A, into downward casting to D. Right? That's what, basically what we're doing. And this will compile. And now temp number two is of static type D. That's why we can simply call, uh, do the assignment over here. But now what's the issue over here? Even though it compiles, but at the runtime, you might still have trouble, right? You're now you not exposing yourself to even more trouble because by this mechanism, just by playing some trick, traversing the hierarchy tree, 
you, you're actually basically losing track of what your dynamic type is. Okay? That's kind of the idea for this uh, example. What's the lesson learned? Be careful when you do cast. Okay? First of all, you have to know what the limitation for the compiler is, and then for you as a programmer, you want to be disciplined when you do the type checking, uh, when you do the casting. Okay? Yes? Can you do double casting in the same line? Yes, you can. Uh, let me, yeah, uh, uh, for example, for example, let me just say that. This cast over here, I'll just sketch the idea for you. Okay. Yes, you can. For example, I can say, first of all, you can say check, well, which, which, fla uh, which flavor to apply completely up to you. Okay. You can say check attached. Remember the short circuit for a conjunction? And then, remember that? That's basically what you're going to use. You can say check attached. Let's say over here we want to cast our B to A. B to A as temp1. And this expression over here is a Boolean expression, as we said, right? This part here. The orange one is a Boolean expression. And then we say if this succeed, short circuit, right? If that succeed, we'll go to the next one. And we can say attached D. And then we can cast temp1, which is guaranteed to be, uh, guaranteed to be evaluated when it actually succeeded. Temp1 as temp2. Then, OK, you can do something here. Right? All right. Check your lecture for Eiffel syntax, and then it's a valid syntax, please. Guy, uh, is it valid syntax? And then, it is, right? Uh, maybe check your slides. All right. Yeah. So oh, n is a. Yeah. So n. So n, well, again, well, I, I, we briefly talk about this in the beginning. n is the Boolean uh, conjunction, completely Boolean. That means you have no guarantee. You will always evaluate the left first and then the right. But for n, it's more like an percent n percent in Java. You always evaluate the left-hand side, left-hand side. And if the left-hand side is actually true, you go ahead to the right-hand side. Otherwise, stop there. It's a short circuit. Okay. Yeah, just in this case, basically, we're trying to say if the first cast actually succeeds, we'll go to the next one. And will be, I can check for you in the Eiffel Studio, but I think N is actually better. You want to say if this already fell, just don't do it, right? Okay. No, 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 no. Well, what I'm trying to say over here is, I'm trying to say make compiler, make sure it compiles, right? The idea is we are trying to comp uh, combine two casts together into one single Boolean condition, yeah. rather than nested. But I'm saying, I don't think we would ever actually have to do two casts in a row on one thing. Like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, well, actually, I'm not sure what, okay. You gotta understand what the thread of the conversation is. Our conversation, our conversation was, we started with this example over here, and then we say that since the syntax allow you actually to do a double cast, to go to the root and then come back here, it allows that. And now the question by your colleague was, can we do these two casts in a single line? That's why, why I'm showing here. So it would be useful if you actually want to do uh, something like this. To actually want to say, oh, I want to cast B eventually into type D. No. At the runtime? Yeah, but a compiler allows that, so some people might still write, write it. Uh, what's the use of short circuit? Uh, short circuit, very briefly, uh, the short circuit is going to evaluate the left and then the right. If the left is already false, you don't even go bother to evaluate the right. 
Yeah, actually, short circuit is actually quite important, right? So I would suggest, if you are not too sure about short circuit, maybe check my uh, lecture recording. I think I maybe either the first or second lecture I talk about it. Yeah, if you still struggle, maybe we can talk after class. It's just that it's kind of off the track for, of what we're talking about now. Uh, Google a little bit slower. I don't quite follow. So what do you mean? It cuts from C to A. Okay, C to A, and then A to B. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not to follow your question, Bear. But if you really try to do cast from C to A, which is okay for upward casting and then do another downward casting from A to B. So the new static type we have is actually B. That means you can only call feature that's defined on class B. But it's, it's always C. Depends on which variable you're using. You can see over here, for example, when we say, okay, let's see this. Check attached. Let's say we have C over here of type C. Attached, let's say uh, we want to catch to A, C, S, temp 1. Okay, for temp 1, we know it's going to be of static type A, right? And then I can do another cast over here. Over here, and then what we can do is we can cast back to B. And now, if you want to do temp1, you put the temp1 over here, and then you can say S temp2. And now, what's the static type for temp2? B, okay. So now we're back to B over here. Then, so now, over here, in this body of the uh, check over here, you can refer to different variables as you like. You can refer to C, right? You can also refer to uh, temp1. You can also refer to uh, temp2, temp1 and temp2. So what will be the difference here? The difference is the static type for each one of them is different. The static type of C is what? What's the static type for C? C, right? Just here, no problem. That means you can only call whatever feature that's available in class C. What's the static type for temp1? Well, it's uh, A here, right? And what's the static type for temp2? It's uh, B. Okay, so that's how the compiler is going to judge. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. So basically my point is, under this uh, block over here, you can still refer to all the three different variables. Right? Good. All right, guys, that's good. Sometimes if no question, I'll be too worried. So. But too many questions can also be worrying, right? <laughs> but that's OK. Any more questions, please? OK, good. Now, this is good. What about we talk about generics? OK, this one's done. I tell you what, given that we are so well trained for this uh, polymorphism type checking here, generics should be very simple. What I will do is I'll show you one motivating example, and I'll go directly to the point of how you can uh, understand the rationale for the generics and see one example, and then I'll give you some design principle for the generics. Okay? That's about for the uh, lecture. Okay. Generics. So now, since you are so good in type checking, please don't let me down. Right? Let's try. Let's say we have a classical book, and then we have an uh, array. Uh, what names is an array of uh, string. As a record, it'll be an array of any. So that means now we are basically giving like an array of objects if you are comfortable with Java terms. And then we have a constructor create an empty book. So now for the add over here, we have string and also record based on what we learned at the runtime. Oh, sorry, not at the runtime. At the compile time, we can say book dot add. What what can be the objects for the second arguments? Anything. 
any descendants of any, right? That's what we learned. Okay, notice that. That means we can store anything into the, uh, the book. And now the catch is when we want to get something from the book, we don't know what it is exactly. The best we can say is any. So what does that mean? That means with the return value from the get feature over here, we can do very little because any has the minimum features available, like objects in Java, okay? Now, let's test your knowledge, okay? I'm gonna show line by line and tell me which line, uh, whether the line compiles or not. Well, this one I can tell is okay, just decoration, right? So birthday of type date, let's assume we have a date class and the phone number of type string. And then we say B is of type book and it's Wednesday, it's just Boolean, okay? So far, so good. Now we say create book b make, right? Also fine, because make is a feature in the book class. Now, phone number, this one looks okay, right? Just assign a string value, nothing, okay? Now, what about this? Number five, compiles? Yeah, right, because, well, basically the first argument just a string value, but the second one is also a string, which is a descending class of any. Okay, very good, you're good. What about number number six, which is creating a birthday? Okay, uh, that's fine. And then let's say we add a birth, uh, which is a, another record. Is that fine? Okay, date is also a, a descending class of any. Okay. Right? Now number eight. Whoa. Please answer that right. Otherwise, we gotta do the lecture all, all over again. No, right? Yeah, you can rewatch it if you like. No, okay, her good. Uh, no, no, oh, no, 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 it's okay, before you say anything. Okay, I, I stare at that, be careful of this, okay? Does it compile? How do you judge? Oh, you know, let's, yeah, we do have get over here for the book, and let's say we also get another feature called get uh, for the dates class, get date of the week. It can be either zero for Monday, and then, oh, sorry, one for Sunday, the first day of the week, and then two for Monday, and then th three for Tuesday, etc. Okay, first of all, compile or not, yes or no? It will compile? No, it will not, because it's, it's, uh, it's I think you can type before. Uh, is it Boolean or what? No, 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 no. Nothing to do with that. We're basically checking to see if this expression over here is equal to four, right? And it's gonna be either true or false, yes. Okay. Okay, you're basically saying that right. Okay, please. Oh, sir, can you say that again, guys? Please, yeah, I'll try to, uh, yeah. Uh, before b.get, you have to type cast as the base, and then you can use... Aha, uh -huh. okay, uh, I tell, uh, let, me, let me also help the rest of the class understand. You, what you're saying is right, we need some cast. But what's the type statically for b.get? Because right now it's uh, any. Any, right? Exactly, that's exactly correct, okay? Since we talk about compilation, so the, what the compiler can do is lo only look at the decoration for the feature. So now over here, when you look at b.get over here, it's going to be of static type any over here. And any does not have this date specific feature. That's why it wouldn't compile. But if you're so sure it's going to return a date object, what can we do? Cast, exactly, okay? That's good. And we can simply, uh, okay, we simply do a cast, uh, which is over here. We can simply, if we are so sure b.get, for example, yuna is going to return a date object. We can cast that to dates, and then we can do exactly what we're familiar with. What's the danger of trying to do such cast? As we said before, this will compile. However, what if the return objects over there, the dynamic type is not something that you can cast into date? For example, what if I do this? Remember, for the very first object I added, Suyam, over here, I only store the telephone number. Let me show you quickly. In this case, it's only the phone number, right? The string. So now, basically, what I'm trying to do is, let's look at the cast. 
if you look at the cast over here, b dot get stat statically speaking is going to be any. Are we doing downward casting or upward casting? Downward, right? Because date is a descending class of any. So doing downward casting, no problem. However, the problem is at the runtime, we're basically casting a string value into the dates. There's in the string class has no like a is uh, like a get date of week uh, feature over there. That's why at the runtime it's going to be runtime assertion error, like a cast error. Okay, so far so good. Yes. You can also do that, but uh, uh, yes, you can do that. You can I'll try to avoid that, but you can see already the code gets a little bit too complicated, right? Not just because the check syntax is more verbose in Java than Java, but even in Java, you have to do cast by yourself manually. So now, after we have learned from this, let's imagine this. What if I put a hundred different types of objects into the book? That means anything I get from the book, I might have to do an if then else check with the a hundred different types. You can, can you imagine that? Let's see. That's, well, why, if you're while you do it, you can uh, do it. Uh, questions? Second example? Sure. If you look, uh, you mean this one here, right? You mean the, this one? Yes. Okay, this example over here, first of all, let's talk about compilation. B.get has a static type any, because the return type is any. Any to dates is like going downwards. It's a downward casting. So compilation is fine. And then after, uh, and then, Suyan birthday over here is going to be of static type dates. And then Suyan birthday over here is static type dates, so you can say get day of week. So compilation wise is okay. But the problem is, if you look at what's the dynamic type for that, if you go back to the very first slides over here, you can see the way we added the record for Suyan over here is simply a string. So that means dynamically speaking, you're casting a string into a dates. A string dynamically simply cannot meet the expectation for dates, so it's gonna crash. Good. Okay, given that, let's make things a little bit more general, a little bit more general. Okay, uh, that's what we talk about. Okay, potential problem over here is about maintainability. Let's say we got so many dynamic types that we want to add in to the, uh, the book of any. Okay, because any, any class is a descendant class of the book, of any. Let's see, this is what we want to do. Let's see over here, let's hypothetically, let's say we got C1 is a class, up to C100, we got 100 different classes, 100 different types, okay? And then, and we, let's do the following, we say creates 100 different dynamic types, C1 up to C100, right? Now we got 100 objects, each one of them is of different type. Now, what we want to do is, oh, I, oh by the way, uh, I, want, I forgot one detail. You can see, for example, when we create the very first objects of dynamic type C1, we add it into the book. And then we do this, the same thing for C100, up to C100 over here. That means after, at the end of this fragment of code, we got the size of the book being 100. And then each, the dynamic type for each one of them is simply different. Static type is just any. Now, what's the problem over here? Well, let's say C1, C2, C3, up to C100, they got different features for each class. If I want to call a particular feature for this class over here, for the return object from the book, I should do a cast to that particular class before I can call that feature, right? That's what we learned. A A can you see how, can you imagine how complicated the code would be? It would be, let's see. Conceptually, if you look at that, let me just uh, finish the code over here, and I'll take your question. For example, you might say over here, if I say b dot get gym, let's say, and b dot get is going to be only statically just any, so I'm just doing some downward casting to c1. If this succeed, I can go to call some f1, which is defined in c1. And similarly, I got to do all sorts of uh, casts like this in order to actually get to what I would like. Because I know that what I can expect from the book is just any, okay? As I said before, the design principle, if you're doing such cast too, uh, too much, there's something wrong. You shouldn't write your code in that way, no matter how good you are, okay? I mean, how good a programmer you are, yes. 
You can also do if statement as I explained before. Here I'm just trying to show you can also do cast. Hmm? But you know you cannot basically you cannot get around by checking the dynamic type for each return object. That's the point. Each time you got some return object from the book, it's simply of that uh, static type any. So that's why you always gotta do some kind of cast or to check the dynamic type. No, you cannot. No, you cannot. Can you actually get a dynamic type for a particular objects directly? No. No, you cannot. Actually, even if you can, for example, let's say you can. Let's assume you can. Let's say I got, let's say b dot get gym, for example, right? If I can say b dot get gym dot get dynamic type, what would you do with it? You might say if this dynamic type is c1, I'll do something. Else, if dynamic type is c2, I'll do something else. You still cannot get around with the if statements. So your code will still be very complicated. My point is over here. The problem for the book of any is whenever you get anything from the book, you can only assume it's any objects. If you want to do anything that's more specific to it, you have to know more about its dynamic type. And that will uh, involve a very exhaustive check of all the dynamic types you might be interested. Okay. So that's the point. Okay, any questions until now? Are we okay? Yep, that's exactly what I'm gonna say. So up to now, we haven't talked about generics yet, right? So I'm just trying to motivate you, right? I'm trying to try, oh, you thought that's a good solution? No, 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 it's not. <laughs> sorry, 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 okay, yeah. So this is bad solution, okay, very bad. If I give you this question in the midterm, you should be able to tell me why it is bad. Why it is bad? Because the return type from the uh, book is simply just any. That means you, if you want to do anything useful to it, you gotta do cast. Is very bad. So now, what would be a good solution? Generics. But let, rather than going through the slides, which you might be bored, why don't I just go to iPad here and sketch what a solution might be quickly for you? Okay, this is the book of any. Okay, and now the problem is, okay, here is a possible solution. Okay. First of all, let me circle where we mentioned about any. You can see the any over here, and also the any over here, and also the any over here. Intuitively, let's say I want to have a book of birthday. That means this any here should be replaced by birthday, and this any over here should also be replaced by birthday, and this any here also should also be replaced by birthday, right? You shouldn't really expect to uh, have a book of many objects, many different types of objects, should be a single type, typically. So that means if I can somehow factor out these types into a single one, that would be very nice, right? That, would, that means whenever the clients want to declare a book, they will tell us right away, it should be a book of what? Okay, yeah, so bear with me. So now, that's the idea about parameter. Okay, so that means, so here we want to say that any over here, any over here, any over here, we just want to make it some parameter called G, right? So now we're just talking about generics from a different angle, right? So now what we will do is, from the supplier side, we're going to just declare G at a class level, okay? After that, we're going to say over here is going to be G, over here is going to be G, and over here is going to be G as well. Anywhere you think you might want to use that particular type that will be instantiated later, you use G, whatever the parameter type is, okay? Now, that's a supplier side. What about the client side? For the client, they only want to do one thing. Um, before I take a question, let me finish this. For the clients, this is where they declare the book they used to. How do we improve that? So now, we put a little bit more burden on the clients. We want to say, if you want to use the book, you better specify what exactly you expect to use the book. Okay, so now what I can do is, over here as a client, I can say B of type book. And then I'll put date. What does that mean? As soon as I do that, B over here is going to instantiate every occurrence of G on the supplier side by date. 
what does that mean? Let me just uh, put it down. So that means this one over here, rather than G, is going to be date. This one here, rather than G, is going to be date. Here is going to be date. And over here is going to be dates. And now, if we try to look at the client code again, you'll find that what used to require a cast is not going to be, it's not going to require that anymore. But let's have a look. Why don't we? Okay. So now I would like to show you a new page over here. So this, so this slide here just show you how you can we can make a transition from general book into generic book. This is how you should define that as a supplier. Okay. So over here, what you will see is. Okay, let's see the following. You know what? I just put it wrong. I put a wrong picture on the iPad, so I'll just show you on the slide quickly. Okay. So now let's see the generic book. First of all, when you declare the class, you put the generic parameter right there. And then whenever you want to use it, just refer to G. Right? You're pretty familiar with this, right? From lab number two, hopefully. And then array of string, array of G. And then etc. And then so now, any what record can you take for this particular book? It depends on whatever G has been instantiated into, and then also get as well. So now let's have a look at this example over here. Okay. So now you can see line number two. For the client side, there's one extra thing compared with a general book case. We, as a client, we commit in line number two. You should be a book of dates. That means the G is replaced by date. And then the, that's a syntax for creating a, book, uh, a birthday book. So now let's review line by line, especially if you look at line number five, would it compile anymore? No. Yeah, yeah, the reason is, let's have a quick look. The reason that line number five doesn't compile over here is because if you look at this particular uh, slide, I just, uh, okay, over here. If you look at this one here, remember we simply, once we replace the, uh, the G by dates over here, that means whenever you want to add, it's going to take a dates objects, right? It's not going to be any anymore. So that means when you are trying to put a string objects over here, it's not going to compile. It's going to complain. Okay? On the other hand, if you look at line number eight, is it going to compile or not? It used not to compile in the general book example, because what you can get from get is simply just any. But what about in case of generic book? Well, because we already replaced, right? So now if you look back to the uh, notes over here, you can see that the return value is already changed to dates, right? So now it states, so that means b.gets is going to be of type dates, okay? Because we actually declared dates over here. Okay, so that, that's why it will compile. Questions? Only a date book, yes. Yeah, so but the, the, the reason that we want to get rid of uh, array of uh, array of any is because it allows too many different types, maybe even unrelated types. Okay, guys, one more thing to mention. As we learned before, if I have over here, at this feature over here, if the argument type is dates, so what does that mean? Dynamically, I can add any objects whose descendant class of dates, right? So that's a design choice you have to make. I so for example, I can say add record being students. Yeah. So that means I have an array of student polymorphic array. Remember, that's what we said before. Okay. Okay. So now one more thing to mention. One more thing. Okay. We got two minutes. Okay. Let's mention one more thing. Let's think about some design decision. Oops. Okay, didn't see that, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, you see the bad, right? Okay, yeah. Is this good or bad? No, bad. It's bad, okay, yeah. Oh, what's, what, why so bad about this one here? Yeah, you can see that, funny enough, if you actually use generics, which is good, but you actually say it can be any descendant class of any, basically go back to the book of any. That's useless. So this one shows to you, you can use the gen generics, use it cleverly, right? You should really only pass a type over there, at the runtime you can expect any descendant class objects of that particular type. So then it's also bad that you have to do so many casting. Yeah, that's correct. 
Yeah. So whatever whatever issue about casting you have before, it's actually the case. Yeah. Questions. In this case, you're just replacing that by any. So that means to go back to the book of any. Right. Oh yeah. So here, the book. Uh, yes. That's kind of back to your lab two exercise. How many generic types you want to have is completely up to you. You can just.